everybody. We're going to get started in just another minute. Thank you everybody for coming. We really appreciate you joining the Wednesday webinars. Uh, we enjoy ourselves. Tonight is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, for those of you that know me, I always refer to myself as an obsessed learner. And uh, I do about 100 Audible books a year. And it's one of the things I've enjoyed about being with Massive Capital is they provided such a great environment for me to learn in. And uh, the more I learn, the more I learn that I don't know. And uh, that's, uh, if, if you can get that, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. Awesome. So we are gonna get started at 6.06 .06 on Central Time. So thank you everybody. So as you remember, we do these every Wednesday night. And again, to reemphasize, we do these to provide educational content to our audience, all right? So there is, the whole goal of this is to provide educational content. We are not lawyers, we are not accountants, we are not financial advisors. So we share a lot about what we do personally, what we have learned personally. And so we're really excited to take you on this journey. And so we're going to talk a little bit of tonight, who is Massive Capital, partnering opportunities with Massive Capital, and then we're going to talk about the importance of group learning. Um, and so for those of you that at some point, we're going to do a little quick survey too, asking you if you're interested in learning more about learning. <laughs> that sounds funny, learning more about learning. Um, so, and then we'll go through and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. And, uh, and then after a certain point, anything goes for question and answers. Uh, so we love, we love to have the, we call it the after hours where we talk about everything and anything. So um, let's we'll go to the next slide. So we have an awesome event coming up, speaking of learning. So Brenda's gonna pop the code for, sorry, the link for you to join. We also have a special code for you that will give you half off the VIP ticket. And the VIP ticket gives you access to VIP networking rooms. But even more importantly, because this is an all day event, so you're gonna have to have a couple extra cups of coffee to make it through the day. Um, you get access to the recordings because we all know on a Friday, sometimes you have other things that you must do. So you will get access to all of the recordings if you upgrade to the VIP ticket. Um, if you don't, it is a totally free event. And again, it's all because, so you can scan this QR code um, and Brenda's gonna pop into the chat, the sign up link and the 50% off code. Let us know if the uh, link doesn't work, right? We've been texting out the QR codes, we're playing with it. So if, you, if the link is broken or something like that, please uh, let us know. Trevor, back to you. Back to me. Sorry, I got lost on my screen here. Sorry about that. That's fine. Uh, we also need the link to register. Uh, I can pop that in if we don't. So a little bit about Massive Capital. We are merging with a company called Realty One. Um, you've been hearing a little bit about that, but it's super exciting. So we are a vertically integrated company. But the only thing that we don't have in our portfolio of what we do right now is managing multifamily assets, although we're highly involved in the asset management. And if you missed last week's, be sure to go to our YouTube channel and watch last week's where we showed some of the systems about how we manage. We do specializing ground up construction. So retail, flex space, industrial, self storage and mixed use multifamily. So on the other side, so we would do equity, we have an in-house brokerage and the brokerage again is for commercial retail space, property management in the commercial retail space. We do construction, sorry, development. Um, the construction is a metal structure and we do wood construction. I wanna make sure that a little bit clearer on the construction that we have in-house general contracting. So it's a very important thing for, for us to have. And then we also have our education program, which you'll learn more about here in a few minutes when we get to the educational side of it. Um, 
I got to just move this pole over because somehow it's blocking all my screws. So where you see all the dots, we have locations. So you can see we're very, very heavy Texas focused. And that's because we are a Texas based company, uh, but we do have properties in Denver, Colorado, just south of Atlanta, Georgia, North Carolina, and we're working on deals in Tampa and, and Phoenix area. So if you look at the bottom over here, the Realty One has about 71,000 square feet of retail, 250 square feet retail center. Yes, it sounds a little bit different. Um, and then almost 500,000. So they have $290 million annum. And then if you look at massive capital, um, somehow the bottom of the slide is getting cut off on my thing here. Sorry about that. We have 36,000 square feet of multifamily, 90,000 square feet for X space, about a million square feet of multifamily, and we have 175 million in assets. So we do land development, building construction. Here you can see the team. So as you know, um, some of the principals got dropped off. They're on somewhere, must be on another slide. <laughs> or did you guys all lose your jobs that we took over? That'd be scary. There you go. <laughs> so all of the teams, so a lot of the regular folks that you're talking to here were across the top. Um, so there's myself, Jasmine, Maria, Candice. These are all folks that you would talk to on a regular basis. Carrie's been doing an awesome job on our virtual webinar that's coming up this week. And then underneath, you have a lot of the team's accounting or finance director, legal counsel. Um, Baskar takes care of all of our at financial analysts. And then we have real estate directors, leasing and equity. So all of these folks are part of the greater massive capital team. Um, and so it's very exciting to be uh, this, this growing this fast. Here's our principles here. So you have Sharar, who always is on these webinars with myself and Sanjay. Um, for those of you that don't know, Sanjay was who I made my first passive investment with five years ago. So it's pretty amazing how life goes full cycle. And then we have Bo, Alexis, Pat, and then Mike Bailey. Mike Bailey and I have been friends for about three years. And I tell you, every day I work hard just to keep up with Mike Bailey. So Mike, Mike is a beast. He runs uh, all of the whole department that we're on. And that man gets things done and uh, super excited how much I've learned. So a little bit about what's going on. So if you look into 23, so we closed new land development, Amberwood Apartments in Fort Worth, Warner Robins in Georgia. We did a raising capital for a new development, X-Space Houston. Construction will start very soon on that. We did a value add in Denver. We have a class A retail in Conroe, Texas. We have another land development in Katy, Texas. We've added a deal, which is a 506B, so we can't talk about it. But if you know somebody in Massive Capital and we have an existing relationship. And then we have two deals that are currently happening. We have a 506C, which is a multifamily retail development. It's actually 65% funded now. And then we have a value add property in North Carolina, 42 units. It's an amazing property. It's our second one in that area. So it's really good because we already have a property there. And so we're able to get some economies of scale. So even though it's at 41 doors, get some real economy scale. So you can scan up on the QR code to be able to learn more about these deals or reach out to myself, Jasmine, Mike, uh, Maria, anyone, and we would be more than happy to talk about these deals with you. We're super excited about that. All right, so if you're a landowner and you own the land and it's in a A-class location, in other words, close to a major metropolitan area, we're interested. If you wanna bring the land and have us develop it, we are interested in talking to you. You can send an email to deals at massive.capital. And please note, there's no .com. A lot of people send it to .com and it goes nowhere. So deals at massive.capital. And all of the principles and all of the people. So it's our first name at massive.capital. So you can reach out to all of us. So we're in the multifamily space very heavily, as you saw. We've got quite a few doors. And we sponsor projects that often have a heavy capex and need some real professional management brought to it. We're super, super involved in the asset management of all of our assets that we do. 
And many of our multifamily deals we do with partners. Partners is the magic of, of massive capital. So in all of these locations, we have partners that need a bigger partner for them to be able to take a deal to the next level. So we provide the balance sheet, the, the, the experience, uh, put into the different uh, things that they need for the loan. And then of course we have an educational program now. So you can learn more about it. Um, we put the, we can put the link up here to learn some more about it. So we have a CRM system, a customer relationship management tool. And the beauty of our tool is it is designed for exactly what you need to do. So that is super important. If you buy an off the shelf and you're just doing it, you have to do a lot of things yourself. We also have a capital raising certification. And the beauty, again, sometimes if you get certified and you can work on massive capital deals, deal flow is always, deal flow with a credible sponsor is always a much needed thing for capital raisers. And then we have our full GP acceleration program. Super, super excited. So we're working on a couple of deals and some friends of mine, you know, they joined the massive capital and they're actually taking an active lead from contract to close. So they're going and they're closing one of the biggest deals of their lives with the support of massive capital. And that would not happen in many other mentoring type programs. So super excited about that. All right, you know what I'm going to say next. Get your seatbelts on. Uh, all right. Um, I, I get, one day we're going to count how many words a minute Sharar talks, but uh, he talks a lot. And what I'm going to do too is I want to be able to. If you're interested in learning about more about our educational program, any of the programs that we have, just put yes in the chat, and then we can reach out to you individually. Um, and again, there's no pressure. Our goal is to provide value to you. So it's very important that we do that. Um, and, and, you know, it's all about learning. And, you know, again, I've been doing this for five years and I, I'm a, just fascinated with it. And the more I learn, the more I get. So awesome. All right. Put your thank you. On. <laughs> so again, uh, if you'll come in, uh, I would say as we go through the next section, I'll introduce some concepts. As usual, what we call it case study is the, one of the best way to learn. And our role is to share framework because you know, everybody's different in our phases in life or places in life and available time in life. Not everything will be right for everybody. So as we go through the framework, just under, I mean, you know, hear, hear us out. When you get some time, go back to YouTube and listen to them a little bit more then our request is apply that on yourself, right? There's a tagline that we've been using and you know, what we call it, you know, be massive, think massive and take massive actions, right? Unless we apply whatever we learn, there's no fun to it, right? And I know Trevor, you started by saying that you love learning, right? And one of the things is that we have to learn and learning, I mean, no, learning is just part of life. We breathe, we learn. If we don't learn, then we don't move forward. But to me, Learning is one of the most expensive thing we can do, especially at our age, because time is very limited. If I'm learning something, I'm not implementing it to extract value. That means I have some dead time that I'm spending to learn. So to me, I'm very you know, critical about learning that whatever that we learn, it has to have a meaning. It has to have a value that's gonna come back to me. Whether I, you know, I read you know, a whole lot of times just to make myself feel good, I learned some time, be very tactical, so I need to get somewhere. So whole idea of this and you know, the next four or five slides is understanding the time component and the and the learning component, right? And the, the tagline that I would like to take away is the learning curve. I am Indian, as you guys know, are from that continent. I'm from Bangladesh. I have about three PhDs at my house and a bunch of doctors and we call it doctor syndrome, right? I'm an engineer and we call it engineer syndrome that we can do everything, which is right. Not everything, I'm mean, almost everything, but then time is of an essence. Everything runs out of time. So what I would say is just start thinking about that the terminology is learning curve. So next couple of slides, I'll talk about how we learn and how we, how we can be tactical about learning it so we don't have to spend way too much time to learn. 
So there are two kinds of learning, group learning and solo learning, right? And I'll walk you through four different kinds of learning and then how that typically applies on the real estate. Again, this is this is a usual case we'll talk about it. We may have some unusual and I know high flyer type situation, but a version of that will come through. So as you know, there are four different kinds of learning curve. On the left is the diminishing return. I want you to figure it out. There's not much to figure out. You just keep repeating it. And then it doesn't take much of a time. And uh, you know, then we have the increasing returns, which is it takes time to learn that because it takes domain expertise to learn. And then we have the S curve. You learn a little bit, you come into the game, then you really, really uh, showed up and then you become the master, right? Then the complex learning curve. So I'll walk you guys through four different kinds of and how that fits into the real estate. And the way I laid it out, a diminishing and increasing an S and complex, it becomes intense and intense and intense. And so as you kind of go and I'm just to kind of share that with you. And as we talk about it, if you have any questions or comments, please drop a note on the chat. We'll come back and uh, talk more about it. So learning curve, the diminishing return and increasing return. So I grew up in the residential side. Uh, Sanjay grew up on the residential side. Mike grew up on the residential side. When we talk about it that we have done well in the residential side, there is some definition around it, right? And the definition is all relative. If you ask me uh, what is success looks like in a single family, my automatic reaction will be, unless you own 50 houses, you haven't quite made it there yet. Because at 50, you need a big team, you need a machine, you have a deep expertise and you know it, right? So again, that's a relative. So if you think about it that way, early on, the diminishing return, those are typically very quick to learn if you you know, it's, it's, if you're, you know, if, if you know, if you see it one time, somebody repeating it two, three, four, five times, you can figure that out. And then you learn quite a bit fast and your performance goes up and it gets better, better, better. And at some point, there's not much to learn, right? And then you create the value in terms of reputation. So in other words, if I go into a market and I'm competing to buy an asset, faster I can learn, faster I can compete and I can buy something, right? Think about the competition that if I, and I'll let you want to buy some single family houses. Yeah, we go walk five, six, seven, ten houses. We kind of get a pulse of the house, what the good, bad house looks like. And we have a 10 different things in a bathroom to kitchen, to roof, to plumbing, to HVAC. And that's about it. And then you can take out the wall, put the wall back in, not much to it. We all can learn pretty quick. And then it plateaus out, right? Not a whole lot of learning. So that's why typically the single family, two, three, four, five houses, you can get there pretty fast and then you're going to stack them down right there. And then, you know, your time is very short and you can start owning your single families really, really quick. And again, this is the performance and time. Performance means buying something. So think about this. We're in a real estate. We go to buy and we're competing with the, and everybody else in the market and winning it's buying. And that means I have to be at a top end of my performance to be able to buy. So on a typically, if I want to play solo, if I want to buy in a smaller quantity of single family, if I have a W2, not much to learn, I can get there pretty fast and I can start buying right there, right? So that's there. And you create value typically on that end in terms of repetition, right? You buy a house, 200, 300 grand, you make a mistake, price is $5,000, no big deal, it sucks. But if you wait for three years or four years, you make the money back. So you have allowed and that, that type of domain or that type of a, category of investment will allow room to make mistakes and then you start repeating right and it can be and you can have w2 you can work somewhere else you can own your business and you can do it on the side land is it's one of the category that kind of goes in but it but again it's typically on a low quantity level one two three houses a year then you buy you know two three four years take a break come back out so right around that second one it's increasing return uh, the activities takes time. So think about your single family. You bought those on top. You bought those not so much of a rehab, 10 or 15 grand. Put some, you know, do some carpets and some power wash. You're good to it. You bind the homes in a suburb, right? Then you said, I'm going to be adventurous. I'm going to go inner city. I'm going to do a gut rehab, right? You have to learn. That means, you know, here, what happens? You buy a house. Then you do want to, you know, swap out the bathroom, fix the kitchen, then do the HVAC, do the roof. All of a sudden, when you get here, you're a subject matter expert. You can do the whole house, right? So typically, an increasing returns is activities may not be easy to learn, 
values in a domain know-how, like you have a deep expertise, uh, mistakes are made early on, uh, then you can handle the mistakes, but you need a smaller team. Uh, typically what we call it, there is not much, uh, you know, man, two, three, four people, whatever the small is, smaller team that you need. So typically if you have a smaller portfolio of rental, you know, five, 10 houses, Airbnb, that type of thing that happens. Now, the way I kind of put that thing here, let's imagine, you know, we're going to invest for the next 10 years, right? That's our time. Within the 10 years, I can buy 10 properties, one year each, no big deal. Or I can do 50 rehabs in the 10 years. That's it from tech stock. Do, and I can do five uh, rehabs a year, okay. three rehabs a year. So that's where the intensity comes in, right? What's happening, we're doing more on a limited time. And it goes from a more to more because my time is the same, right? So that's why if you go from the simple single to a portfolio with a deep rehab, typically your learning curve is pretty steep. And then once you go through it, it becomes pretty nice, right? Then becomes the fun part of it. Uh, the learning curve in terms of the S curve. So S curve is you come in early, then you have a steep learning curve, then you flatten out. So the S curve and this curve is something in between. That means whoever is coming in, they're coming in with a very dedicated, focused, you know, intentional way of going about it. It's easy to get started. Then it requires a huge learning curve, then it becomes a mastery. Think multifamily now. Think commercial now. Think larger deals now, right? It's, it's, it, it, it's pretty typical on the S curve when you come into a new job or a role or business where competition exists, heavy competition exists, right? Uh, well, when I meant competition exists, think about this way. In Harris County, we have 1.3 million houses, 1.3 no, 1, 1. million properties. If you wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm gonna buy 100. We have 1.3 million in the Harris County alone, and you wanna buy 100. Your probability of getting there is not that bad versus we have about 2,400 apartments and you wanna buy 10 of them. Your probabilistic ways of learning is pretty, I mean, uh, to get there is very intense, right? And that's where your, your performance has to be really, really quick. You have to go up. So you come into multifamily and your performance gotta be really, really high to get to the mastery, right? That's a little bit more mind twisting. So it doesn't allow for most of your mistakes because you got to learn and perform almost immediately. And usually a team is needed. And it's typically best car we see it for multifamily new investors in a smaller syndicating team. Because, you know, when you come into syndicating team, I need balance sheets, I need equity, I need the deal flow, I need to know underwriting, I need to know asset management. Then I need to understand, you know, exit, broker relationship. A lot of things has to happen at the same time to come together to buy a multifamily. So typically we see the S curve here. So what happens, an individual will come in, they will start learning. Then you will figure out, I can do all by myself. You stack other individuals, which is to build a team. Then you become you know, a mastery, a group, and you can buy a multifamily. Again, S curve is pretty usual for smaller syndicating team. We're doing you know, one or two deals a year and they're coming together, and, you know, something like that. Very similar to single family, right? Smaller quantity. That's a complex work, right? We see the S curve put quite there. And then we have the complex curve. This is where it gets intense. I'm gonna go backwards. Complex curve means you are learning for the same amount of time, but you're learning so many things at the same time and so fast. Your performance over the grand scheme of things is not a whole lot. It just takes time to, to slow grow. So you're growing typically a, I would say a, some kind of a company in the complex curve. And here you're growing a smaller team and the other two, which is, you know, you're in and out. So here you see a slow learning at the beginning, then you increase efficiencies, then you have a plateau out. It's almost like you start, again, going back to syndicating, right? You start learning, everybody, almost everybody starts with underwriting, right? We learn underwriting, we get good at it. We build the broker relationship, then we come in here, then we figure out, oops, I don't have enough equity to buy. I don't have enough deal to buy, or I build the team together here, and then I got into the asset, but it's tough to compete, tough to repeat. So let me come back and redo my business and I grow, grow, grow this way. So whole S curve here, it boils down to only this section here. So you compress the learning quite a bit, right? 
uh, what we call it, the more you do, more you find out. This is almost the complex curve. If you want to grow, you're going to go through a version of complex curve and an extremely faster rate because time is limited, right? Typically, it's for a business with many verticals. Uh, back to multifamily, a vertical in a sense will be uh, your broker relationship and underwriting backed up by finance. Then you have the equity on the institutional equity, LP equity, family office equity. Then you have your asset management, then you have your property management, then you have financial reporting. On the legal side, you have SEC, then your in-house legal, um, then contract negotiating, and then it's a whole, all those verticals as you grow, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Why I say that, if you buy one asset for $10 million, I have maybe five big contracts to negotiate that shows up at a yearly basis. But if I have 10 properties, about $20 million each, all of a sudden it's 200 million. Shirai can clone himself at the same time. All of a sudden he needs a team who needs to be specialized and be really good at it so we can get a better value out of the negotiations, right? And this is where the complex carp comes in. So most of the multifamily syndicators that we see, uh, they fall between those two S carp and a complex carp, right? And again, mistakes are made early on. Earlier you make mistakes, those are cheaper. Later we make mistakes, those are more expensive. And the mistakes in the later in the game or late in the game beyond this part of it is, is expensive. By making a mistake on a 200 grand flip, 10, 20 grand. Again, it's gonna hurt, but you're gonna come back out of what the grand scheme of thing. We buy a $10 million asset or $10 million company. Mistakes are typically, I was a 50 grand to 100 grand. We have a 20 to $30 million asset and we make a mistake there as a general partner, those are 100, 200 grand, 300 grand with the mistakes. You can't stomach those, those are, ex those are expensive, those are deep and they're hard. Uh, so mistakes in the later game are not allowed in that sense. And then uh, it, you really need a team to grow. Uh, we see that uh, for the full-time syndicators who are really in the syndicating game, die hard, they in, coming in with the team, and they're extremely focused and intentional and they're managing the whole value chain. Deal sourcing, debt, equity, asset management, dispo, the whole shebang of it, right? And they wanna repeat many times. Think about this, we have 10 years time, hypothetically 10 years time, and you have 10 years and 10 years. You can buy 10, hypothetically diminishing return, you can buy 10 houses in 10 years. And this team is trying to do 500 houses a year for next 10 years every year. So your learning curve is pretty complex, pretty intense, and it has to be team first, right? So those are the way we learn. And then what we always say that, hey, learning to me, it takes time and time is expensive. And if you know all those learning curves, at least we kind of sort of, you know, had an idea. So we asked the question, hey, I want to play the same game slightly differently. So I go through less of a pain. I'm going through the intense work, but I'm going to go through the less of a pain. That means I want to make the learning curve flat wherever possible. So be very intentional about it, what the flat looks like. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to say, you know, a side joke, right? Going to Harvard or going to any IV, extremely tough, right? I mean, whoever, I know love it or hate it, they have a brand associated with it. Those kids are 1%, I mean, fraction of a one-tenth or one-hundredth of a 1% of the whole working force, minus some family relationship, I get it. But in general, those kids are extremely brilliant. They have a different mind. They work in a different channel. Up until that point, they sacrifice their life, right? Love it or hate it, but it is the one way to go about it. And the other way is, if you know how to play the game, and if you want to get stamped on the Ivy League, and we come from regular family, you can increase your likelihood from the fraction of 100% to almost 50% likelihood of getting it. So I'll give you, it's a it's joke, but it is real. And that's, the, that's where being tactical matters, right? I, I worked at Shell, I went to Rice, my brother-in-law went to Harvard. And him and I, we always talk about it, that I interview Rice undergrads and he interviews Harvard undergrads. We look at the stories and resumes. Those are some brilliant minds. When you look at the story, it's like, God dang it, right? That's on the undergrad side, but that's the people will think. Then you come to Shell and I met all of my colleagues and a good chunk of them goes to Stanford, MIT and Harvard. And then we found out that there are a couple of you know, programs. It's a one-year program. 
and not much of a teaching, it's a, more of a collaboration, uh, caught your arm and leg, 100 grand, but those programs has about 53% you know, probability of getting it. So an undergrad, you go try and bless your heart, right? On a grad, on a certain program, all of a sudden 50%. So if you really want to win the game of getting a stamp of the IV and the world pays you whatever they pay you, know which way to play the game, right? Interesting. So the goal is, as you go through it, is that flatten the learning curve, least amount of time spent, very tactical way to get the biggest bang out of it, right? So we always say define the unit of success, solve backwards, don't solve forward. Don't say, I mean, optimal ways. I mean, everybody says I do five, then a 10, then a 20 but then you're out of time in our life. We always say, fall backwards. Say five years from now, I wanna have a billion units, right? I'm just throwing some numbers in there. And today I have zero. Then you figure out what the best way to get there. And then you optimize that for your personal learning curve and you make very informed decision and invest in tool, establish a timeline and get numbers. Right? That flattening the learning curve, going to the YouTube university and testing it out will be tough. You'll be paying that from your time and or your money. That's the way you're going to buy in, right? And on the right side, this is how Massive does it. Uh, everybody that came into our team, our culture, we have a shared value. We have a strategy, put a structure, put a system. We have a style and put the team and a skill set. So right people on the bus, structure, follow the strategy with the advisors will get you flat in the learning curve. And our reality is it's, Carve is not going to be quite flattened, but it's going to be flatter than somebody else, right? And that's the whole idea. So for us, Massive, I'll give you some nuggets as we kind of go. When we started at the very beginning, we knew we don't know nothing. Or we, we don't know a whole lot of things, right? At least we knew that part of it. We don't know a whole lot of things. So we said we need mentors. Then the definition of what the definition of mentors. We said somebody got to have at least half a billion dollars worth of assets for 10 years on average. And their net worth has to be, you know, we started with $100 million or more. Now imagine us three, we don't, we didn't buy any assets yet. When we bought one asset, all of a sudden we're calling people up and looking, hey, what's your balance sheets? How much asset under management? What's your net worth? And then would you be my advisor, right? We went through that. And those set of people who came on board by laughing at us, they, helped us tremendously to get to where we are. So even though Massive sounds a lot, but even though we got there, we have four or five amazing set of you know, human beings, one, they're one phone call away, and they are guiding us in and out. Are they making money to the no? One day will be their partner when we grow up to that level, absolutely so, right? So we owe them a lot. Having those good set of people on your side who can navigate, who has been there, done that, at least plenty of times, and it can help you get there. And that's where you flatten the learning curve. And one of the objective was today was, hey, welcome to the multifamily. Know what what that you know unit of success look like. Then backstyle it. Put yourself into that you know, S carbs or complex carbs. Get the tin, then you go right. So that's that's that. And then this is us. Uh, for us, when the massive capital, when we go through our whole process. You know, our thing was, look, we cannot guarantee. So every single thing has a risk, right? Every project has a risk. Every investment has a risk. Same thing, mentoring has a risk. So our view of the world was, we don't guarantee any success. But what we could do, we could increase the probability of success and decrease the probability of failure. If I could decrease the probability of failure, then we're in the win because the more, you know, dice as you roll, you're gonna get there faster than somebody else, right? So we look at our mentoring session, three ways, planning, development, and performance. And then on the right side is the way we kind of think on a business planning. It's a business plan for the individual, it's the market, it's the legal, investor, asset package, and the time, and the team profile. So all of our, and our partners, we say, hey, they have what we have, we have what they have. <laughs> so we kind of go together. Uh, so we always come back with that. And you know, then we have team. We have SEC attorneys. We have a negotiated price. Uh, we have a, a cadence for the entities, what we want, corporate insurance. We have a set CPA. We have a property management in-house now. No, not sorry, but not property management. We have property management companies on hand. 
Then brokerage deal flow, we have 32 some odd properties in our deal flow now. We have a set amount of titles and inspectors are one phone call away. And then this is where we take a look at it because multifamily is a business, right? Uh, you know, so you got to find the deal, value it, then commit it. And that's your deal flow, right? Which is the contract. Now on the capital side, left to right, you identify who you're going to you know, target, you qualify them, you hang out with them, you pitch them your deck, you raise it, they come to the deal. And then on the operation is operate, then you add working capital and you sell and it goes in a circle. If you look at all of them, if you buy 20 units, you can do them all. You can buy 100 units, fine, you can do it all. But once you start doing multiple things, you can't. Or you can, but you're not going to grow, right? You're going to go back to that S curve. You buy one or two, one, three, and that's it. The earlier we understand that, good. Now, when time is tough, like today, this capital raising, it's a business by itself. Someone can invest all of their time and become a master of capital raising. That's a machine that should work by itself, right? Raising one time $500,000 is one thing. Raising every month $1 million is another thing. Raising $3 million a month is another thing, right? And then, you know, deal flow. Everybody loves underwriting. But the truth is, underwriting, it's a means to an end. It gets you into the game. But underwriting will not make you win a deal. If the asset management will make you win a deal, so you know what assumption to put in. Other thing is, if I don't own an asset, how do I know what assumption to make, right? This is where the slippery slope comes in. This is where sometimes we'll make a mistake on especially the new ones. You know, then when you go buy, you don't know an asset, you're making assumptions. When market rise, no big deal. When market goes south, your assumption gets tested. And those assumptions gets tested, who pays the price, especially the newer ones, right? So that's one of the things that's happening now at dominant talks of you know, syndicators, they're hurting today. They made money from 17 to 19. They flipped in three, four years out, 19 to 21. They rolled their money in in 2021 till now. And you know, it is what it is today, right? That's that. And on that note for us, going back, everything got to be grounded by reality, right? Uh, someone asked me the question, hey, Sharar, uh, you guys talk about capital raising. We have a call on Monday. Uh, we teach how to raise capital. What's your expertise, right? And I say, look, we, you know, massive capital is young, you know, two years into the game, but in two years we raised forty-five million dollars. In two years we have sent, I don't know, half a million texts, about half a million emails. We track a lot of data. So when you talk to Maria, when you talk to Trevor, when you talk to Ramiz, they're running a machine where a lot of people will raise ten, fifteen million dollars in the lifetime, and we raised it in two years, right? So everything that comes in, that comes from the tactical view of it. And whoever it is that you go partner with, make sure they have something that is closer to where you want to be at, right? That's the whole idea that a freshman cannot hang out with the freshman to figure out what job that they're going to get, what GPA do they need, right? You need some freshmen, some sophomores, some senior, some PhDs, which is our mentors. Put together, you build a team so you know how to go through the school, as you go through it, you get that good GPAs, then you go get a job, and you know, relationship matters. Not all jobs are made the same. And then you put those certain jobs that put you in a higher shallow office so you can grow. Right? So that's the whole idea that learning as a team with a very tactical team who's been on walking the same path with you, it's different. I come from Shell, we've been through enough lawsuits. So when I look at those ACC attorney, it's funny, I'll, I'll give you an example. There are two kinds of attorneys. One does template, never put the foot into the door to uh, battle the judge. The other one does litigation. I run away from anybody who is a template-based attorney. They have no value to me because you didn't get sued yet. You didn't battle the cases yet. You don't know how hard it is when you get sued. I love the attorneys who litigate. They are they're like a hounds. They know uh, when to go fight. They know how to negotiate because they've been there. A good blend will be an attorney who used to litigate or has a litigation and a litigating arm, but they work closely on the other side who are template based, right? But usually an attorney is like, God, it's an attorney. Then you take a look at it and what kind of attorney are those? Then you say, hey, how long you been an attorney? Been an attorney for five years, you haven't seen that much. 
you've been a litigation attorney for five, 10 years, and then you convert it into an, you know, in a template based, fine, sounds good. Take my business, right? So as we, you as you go through it, there's a lot more we need to test. There's a lot more we need to qualify, and then go build a business. Right? So, and here you are. If you have a questions about what we do, uh, we have one stick case study here, and we have Monday uh, Maria runs that capital raising call, and then we have our uh, in deal flow call that Sanja runs it, and that is it. So I talked a lot. Reds and open for questions. We can go from there. Awesome. Have Thank you. I'll stop sharing. We'll go from it's there. A good looking team. <laughs> I give you that, that's for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. So feel free to put any questions in the chat. Um, unmute yourself. This only gets better when the questions get better. Like any question goes, okay. Yeah. Any question goes. Somebody's got to have a question. I see some familiar faces. Thank you, everybody else, for coming in. This is. So, with the Learning coaching well. program, um, so how long until you become a GP? Uh, that so what? A general okay. partner. Got it. Um, I'll take a shot. Where's Sanja at? Oh, he's at the airport. Ma Mike, you want to give it a shot first, and then I'll give him my view of it. <laughs> uh, it's it's very uh, it's really relevant. On, uh, nobody's going to want to hear this part, but it's relevant to what the the person puts into doing uh, in the process. Uh, you know, I I can give multiple examples. We have uh, some people that you know, have become a GP in uh, a few months. Uh, some have been, you know, a couple months and some have been, you know, three or more months, five, six months. Uh, you know, it, my case, I would just share my case was, you know, I uh, went at this, dove in and decided this was what I was going to do. And once I had my intention there and my direction and distributed my priorities and time towards that that you know i made sure it was going to happen um it took me though uh from when i really started so i started um after i actually i joined another program but after i started it was about three months before i did my first deal all by myself uh, but the opportunity to be a GP, uh, you know, and working with us has has a potential to be, you know, quicker than that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it comes to, hey, am I going to apply myself? Am I going to put in the effort and do what it takes to make this happen? You know, we we have the tools. We have the, you know, the the way that we go about showing everyone how to do everything. And everyone gets to sit in the laboratory with us as we're doing the experimenting and doing the building the, the things, you know, and as we're building and doing all that stuff in the laboratory, uh, you know, everybody's there with us. So it just becomes the more you put yourself around what you want to do, the faster that's going to happen. Uh, you know, I think I've seen people that, without really getting in or following this, you know, it could be a couple of years. You you got to have some of the right connection. Sometimes the right roles happen and, and just being available. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you. No, this yeah, is and the right no. team, the right team gets you there quicker. Um, so I'm living proof of that. So I did three GP, GP deals in 18 months before I joined massive capital and I've done six so far this year with three more in the hopper. Um, so if you want to get your hair set on fire, I don't have any hair, I guess. But uh, so so again, at long, it really depends on who you surround yourself with. Also, how well you apply yourself. So capital raising is the quickest way to get on a team because every deal needs money. So if you're building your brand, if you're building your presence, if you're connecting with potential investors, 
Um, and that's why we have the, you know, that, that, that introductory capital raising program, um, because it's a quicker way to get in. But then when you really, most people still want to get to the next level. Um, and, and, but th that's the quickest way to get in and being on a strong team is the, you know, is the way to get there. That's really awesome, right? So if you bucket it out, there are about three buckets. There are three uh, swim lanes per se to get to the ownership, right? You got deal flow, then you got the capital, then you got the asset management, right? What we call ourselves that we accelerate whatever that you want to be. We are one of those group of people, whatever you want to do, we're going to push you to do it. And we're going to push you to do it 10 times, right? That's why it's us like, like a, I would say a magnesium, right? Go learn, go to school, learn your ABC. When you want to really strike a higher score, come to us, we'll, we'll take you there. That, that's because underneath of everything, we are biased towards doing deals. Our philosophy has been good deals exist. It does not exist for everybody. If you know how to go get it, you can still find the good deals independent of the market cycle. And you just structure the deals differently. And that's the way we operated. That's the way we operated last year and this year. And that deal flow, it's the biggest and you know, a super part that you can have. Because what we do, we go somewhere, we spend the time on the Excel, time to underwrite, then have to build the confidence uh, with the broker. Then broker is not going to give you the time because I'm a new guy. Then I got to put a team together, put a resume. Again, nobody wants to work because I'm a new guy. And then I got to go back. And I, then you got to work your way through. And with us, our team, we actively do deals all the Just time. So when someone comes in and says, I'm the best asset manager, we'll be like, fine, here you go. Go run the asset, go sit down, make a decision and see what happens. We have seen where I'm the best asset manager in the whole universe. I come in three months on the way. Asset manager is not my forte. I hate it. I want to go to capital raising. Versus someone else to the capital raising, went to the asset management, they loved it. So our thing is that we need to short cycle the time. So whoever comes in, it's like a simulation. We have live deals. We have eight deals we're running, or 10 deals we're underwriting, or five deals we're sending LOI. Go do it. You don't know what LOI looks like? Here we go. That's a template. Go right. You send out the LOIs today. Before you send out the LOIs today, you got to do XYZ. So our role, at least from our team of it, setting the hair on fire, it's literally true. We have the, the thing that we strive to hear from our groups or partners is that you guys go too fast and you do too much. Yes, that's correct. That's because life is too short. You don't want to one deal every five years, then 10 years down the way, you have done two deals, time to do retire, right? So that's, so that's that. And this is where this one come in. Just think about 10 deals, month number 11. And to get 10 deals under contract, there is another 500 deals that we underwrote. Uh, like here, I'll show an example. We use Red IQ. Uh, since we started Red IQ Q1 this year, we underwrote 433 properties. That's only here. We have a bunch outside. And if someone says, I know how to underwrite, I want to do underwrite, I want to be a such a matter expert, let's get to play. Right? So that's how we operate. And that's how we add value by letting, getting into this, and you know, those thick of it really, really quick, really, really fast. And so what is that about four and a half billion of uh, assets underwritten? Something like that. Something like that. So it's, it's crazy. I, I'm 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 done looking at it. <laughs> Rosario asked a question about starting with single family before he goes into multifamily. And I, I never did single family, but everybody I know never says, Oh, I wish I didn't like I wish I'd have waited longer to switch to multifamily. Everybody, you know, it's 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 okay to start there if you're on a good team. Single family is for yourself and your family. It, it's not a it's not a very team sport. But if you can get into a group or get on a team, you know, my recommendation is that you know to start as quickly as you can. And again, remember what Shar said earlier, right? You, on the smaller deals, you may make a few mistakes, but they're smaller mistakes, right? Don't go knock off two hundred and fifty dollars on your first deal. Um, or be with a team that's done a couple 250 deals and you've joined them. Um, that's my advice, but there are others that I know. How many single family did you do, Sharar? I think Sharar didn't do any single family. He just did he land. Well, no, I and, did. I did about seven. No, total land was, no, hold on. I counted the other day. Someone asked, a little over 80, but I didn't do a darn thing. 
I, I didn't. I don't, I'm not a fixture upper guy. I'm not. I, it's a pricing arbitrage for me. In and out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did uh, off and on. So I ramped up to about uh, 35 single family homes uh, that I was, you know, owning, operating, kind of doing that burr method with. And really just for me, I, I, I capped out and that was really, I couldn't scale it, you know, and I, I just wasn't in a way to scale that anymore. It's like Trevor, you know, and it became truly a job, but not, not that multifamily is not a job, but I was doing a lot more work for, I was doing as much work for 35 houses, you know, kind of as I, as I may do for, uh, you know, three multifamily deals. So there's, there's just a different way of, of looking at that. And so I, I don't, you know, and like Trevor said, I don't, I don't think there's any amount of requirement of like, you need to do so much of single family. I, I almost would suggest like Trevor did and just jump that step. If you, you, if you're already there, that's great. You don't have to do more. You can keep doing it because it may be as you're doing flips or something and it's bringing you cash or that's your main cash. And then do, you know, be learning and doing the multifamily side by side with that. You know, so there's a lot of different scenarios. And that's one of the things we do. We do try to help and talk with talk through as as people, you know, it is figure out that path. What is the right path? We're not financial advisors, but we've been there. We've experienced, we have, you know, amongst our team, a number of different paths that we've gone. And we all know, you know, what is, makes more sense now, what's more preferential. How can we help people get to their quickest path uh, that makes sense for them uh, as they go. And we, we've helped people really switch their paths uh, some people that were really struggling to to get started and they came along with us and uh, you know they like I'd said earlier spent maybe a year on another program and hadn't made any progress and within a few months with us they were in their you know two three deals so uh, just just different ways there and I, hey while I'm got the mic here guys I want to I don't know Blake if you're still here Look at the chat. I I was trying to connect with you. Uh, we can talk after this uh, as well. And hey, I also yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, it's just Blake here. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Um, I sent that in the chat. So yeah, we'll we'll link up after this. Okay. Awesome. And what I did my journey a little bit different that I had a full time job that I loved and I thrived at. So I started as a passive investor. And it wasn't until my 14th passive investment that I started even considering going over to the GPL, GP model. And what I learned on that is how other sponsors treated me and what I liked and didn't like about it. So I became one that that tried to amplify all the things that I liked and, and the type of deals and the way I communicated. So go ahead, Brenda. Yes, I'm going to drop the link of the coaching program. I just want to emphasize how amazing this program is. I did, uh, I just started my journey with multifamily and it was a very hard process. Nobody would take you serious because they're like, what's your credibility? What's your track record? And so now I'm behind Massive. Everybody's like, oh, how can we help you? Because they see the track record of Massive Capital. So if you're really interested in the program, I would highly recommend it. And then you're sitting in the table with them while they're underwriting and you learn the process and then you become, like they mentioned, a GP within a few months. So I would highly recommend any of y'all checking out this coaching program. Yeah. So, that was Let me it. add a little bit to it, right? It, going back to Rosario's question, everybody's journey is different. If you ask me, single family gets you the confidence. And then you come to multifamily commercial that becomes a business, right? You're coming in to buy a business. Don't think about property as a property, right? Conventional way of thinking will be, hey, I have to buy one houses. Now I want to buy 500 houses uh, or 100 houses. That's, yes, it's true. On the flip side is you used to be a CEO of a $200,000 company. Right now you're going to be a CEO of a $20 million company. 
they're different, right? And then Maybe our role stop, is to stop sharing so we can okay. see everybody too. Sorry, right, cool. No, that's fine. So I like thank to see you. Their smiling faces. So, so when you come in to multifamily side, and our role is to give you, you know, just come hang out. We are business owners. You want to be a business owner? Let's get to work. Let me show you the pulse. What does it take to operate, right? A $20 million company COO, asset managers, they're not the same as a $200 million portfolio manager or COO. Different. And we all got that 10 or 15 years in our life. If you want to go from zero to 200, it's different. So if I have a W-2, I'm working, I'm, I'm, I'm good at it. If I, if I have 10 hours extra, I don't want to switch domain. I want to stay where I'm at. Because after 10, 15 years, 20 years of my job, I'm pretty efficient about it. I want to know if I if I have efficient, I have some extra time. I'd rather work passively, right? Or if I hate my W two and I'm done with it, I hit my ceiling. I fight with my manager all day long, and I'm gonna find something new. We'll come home, right? So it all depends. So, and my recommendation, if you have the setup and the knowledge base where you can avoid the single family, avoid the single family. Come to commercial. You have you get to leverage your strength, W two solid earning, good credit, good relationship. You got good friends making the same what you're making. Why buying a $200,000 to house? Buying a house worth of $2 million. You make the same 10%, but 200 grand will go further, right? So that's that's what I would recommend. But don't but start it. Whatever you do, buy a thing. Send the offer out. Jasmine? Jasmine? Yeah, just wanna add, uh, just to piggyback on that. So I started with land and I did probably like close to 100 uh, purchases on, on just residential land. And after that, I was like, what, what should I do next? Should I get in single family, fix and flip, Airbnb, all these things that you can do in real estate. And I came across multifamily, explore that option. And the mind blowing that, I, you know, the biggest takeaway was like, so that means I can just jump straight to, multifamily and I, there's no requirement just like Trevor said and I want to highlight there's no requirement that you need to be single family two years before you can do multifamily so I just went straight uh, to multifamily and uh, just looking at the question then uh, Abraham said uh, how can we provide value to massive capital? So when I came, uh, when I decided I wanted to get in multifamily, I connected with Mike Bailey and I asked him, like, this is what I can do. My background is in sales. I've been working with investors. I think I can do uh, investor relations. So I, it's pretty much what, you know, whatever your background is, just leverage that. Sometimes like we think like we have completely completely different backgrounds, but everything is transferable to multifamily and to all these deals. So the question is like what your superpowers are, what your what your background is, and just tell us what what you what you want to do and we will take it from that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you has a very inspiring story. And Abraham had a question as well, just about, you know, how, how, can, how can he bring value to us to work together? Um, so we are always, of course, looking for deals. We're looking for local partners, but it's really hard. Most of the local partners that we're looking for, we're helping them on their second or third deal. Um, so they've got a track record that helps us get into a new market. Um, but there, there are ways always to bring value. Thank you. Also, uh, congratulations, Abraham. Uh, you made the first move. And and I trust me, it helps. Hang out with the right set of people. They'll take you there. I struggled when I came from, even though I've done high velocity buying, but the total dollar amount, I struggled. Uh, when I came in, I still remember, I was mentally, I was comfortable with three, four, five million dollar shopper. Uh, I hang out with another guy and he, my first large property I walked with him was $9 million. Third property I walked, it was $22 million. And then the group I hang out with $22 million, we made an offer on the first deal at $19 million. I go from $100,000, 150 grand worth of properties, our transaction, all of a sudden $19 million. And I knew the team who can make an offer on a $19 million deal in 30 minutes, 
they have something, right? And that team ultimately become the massive capital team. So who you hang out with matters completely. And then you got to add a value. When I started, my again, Jasmine, if I if I look at Jasmine, she traded a lot of land. She knows what good a good deal looks like, number one. Number two, she knows how to build a relationship. On the single family, when you buy a lot of things, you got to have a relationship skill. Otherwise, you can't buy that many. Same with me. When I came in, I knew those guys, and I knew Houston. Houston was my stomping ground. I was buying 60, 70 properties a month. Um, so I can get to a valuation faster than anybody else because I own assets. That was my value add to the team. Hey, if there is a deal out there that if that passes my test, eight out of 10 times, that deal has got to be a good deal, right? That's, that was my value as When I came into the team, I brought in a deal that I underwrote. I like the setup. I think it's going to pass. Then I made a proposal, which is different than... My cousin is a broker who got a deal who shopped around the market for 10,000 days. I was like, uh huh, I know sure I are. Let me drop an email, right? That is not the value yet. That's value destruction because you are spending the time out. So your value yet will be go underwrite a deal, put yourself into the test. You only need a coaching session, work with somebody, underwrite a deal. When you're stuck, come to us. We'll help you how to unstuck the scenario. Good question. Awesome question. Awesome. Cool. It's seven oh seven. You want to stop the recording? Yeah, we can good. stop the recording. That that way, we can have some questions that aren't recorded for the whole world. Not that we not that we do anything too sly here. Okay. We talk, right? So, any questions? Is, no. But the one not thing that we everybody do anything crazy after, is, on the after hours party. But I would say, hey, hey folks, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, um, this is Abraham Bakri. Um, I'm in uh, Lakeland, Florida. I just asked the question earlier about providing value.